morning. Welcome to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. I'm Kim McClary, President and CEO, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here today. Thank you all for your ongoing support. As a small nonprofit, we depend on your viewership and contributions. We are committed to bringing you a rich lineup of programs on the most compelling and timely issues. It's now my great pleasure to introduce today's program, a conversation with Admiral Harry B. Harris, former U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of Korea. I would like to thank the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for the Republic of Korea for their support of today's event. Before we turn this over to the ambassador, I would like to welcome the Consul General of Korea for Los Angeles, Kyung J. Park, who will just say a few words. Good morning, Our members of the LA World Affairs Council and Town Hall and distinguished guests. It is my great honor to invite distinct members and guests to the conversation with Admiral Harry Harris, former ambassador to the Republic of Korea, co-hosted by the LA World Affairs Council and Town Hall and the Korean Council General in LA. On behalf of the government of the Republic of Korea, I'd like to extend my sincere gratitude for his service as the U.S. Ambassador to Korea, and furthermore, for sharing his precious time with us to share his views on the U.S. relations with Korea and mm -hmm. other Pacific countries. Given his uh, magnificent career as commander of the U.S. Pacific Command and Ambassador to Korea, I have no doubt Admiral Harris will provide outstanding insights on the geopolitics of Asia Pacific region. I know that the Biden administration is currently reviewing the policies toward North Korea. I look forward to abounding ideas and wisdom to make progress in denuclearizing North Korea and promoting peace and prosperity of the Korean Peninsula. My special thanks go to Dr. John Bach for moderating today's webinar and Chairperson Kim McCleary, Blue and Step of the LA World Affairs Council and Town Hall for making this webinar possible. Thank you very much. Ambassador, it is such a pleasure to have you here today. I know you're going to be making a few remarks. And then after that, Dr. John Park, our moderator, who is the director of the Korea Project at the Harvard Kennedy School, will join you. So let me turn this over to you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Uh, and, and thanks, uh, LA uh, World Affairs uh, Council President Kim uh, McCleary Blue for that kind introduction. It's quite an honor for me to participate in this event, to follow the distinguished Consul General from Korea, Park Yakyung Jae and to be moderated by the distinguished Harvard professor, Dr. John Park. I want to give a shout out to Ms. Jessica DeAndre and the whole team at the LA World Affairs Council for facilitating this event. Now, I can't think of a better way to begin what is hopefully at the beginning of the end of the pandemic. Get vaccinated if you haven't. That's my public service announcement for the day. Uh, in my post-government life, uh, then to share with you my thoughts on the alliance uh, between the U.S and the Republic of Korea, or ROK. Now, before I get started, I'd like to say a few words on the deplorable events of January 6th in Washington, not that long ago. The violent actions of the mob that attacked the U.S. Capitol, an attack on the U.S. democracy itself, serve as a sharpest reminder of America's challenges, but also America's strength, resilience, and longstanding commitment to democracy. I take hope from Amanda Gorman's inaugural point that our nation, quote, isn't broken, but simply unfinished, unquote. President Joe Biden is now the 46th commander in chief of the United States. I emphasized to my interlocutors in Korea before I left last January that the noble work of the alliance will continue, and I express my confidence that President Biden and his team will continue to work with leaders there to strengthen the relationship in all its dimensions, not just the security dimension. Paraphrasing Goethe, divide and rule is one approach to governance, unite and lead is another. I look forward to President Moon's upcoming visit to, uh, to Washington. Now, as I've said on countless occasions, in uniform and now in Mufti, international relationships matter and alliances matter. They are the most integral element of U.S. foreign policy. I hope you've had the chance to read the Biden administration's new interim strategic guidance. It recognizes that 
alliances aren't luxuries, they're essentials. President Biden calls alliances our greatest asset. Last month in an op-ed, Secretaries Blinken and Austin made clear that alliances are vital to our national security. They deliver for the American people. In my opinion, this guidance, this guidance underscores the fact that when you work with allies, give and take is preferred to slash and burn. Case in point, their almost 71 year US ROK alliance was forged during a devastating conflict. It has stood the test of time. It's mind boggling to consider how much has changed in the world in general, Northeast Asia in particular, and the Korean Peninsula especially since 1950. Some changes have been for the better, such as the ROK's miraculous growth into an economic and cultural powerhouse, a high tech innovation nation which is leading in the battle against COVID-19. As you may have heard, South Korea faced a third wave of COVID outbreaks at the end of 2020, centered in the capital and surrounding areas. Korea went on virtual lockdown when they had 1,000 cases a day across a country of 52 million people. As of today, Korea has experienced a total of 119,000 cases and only 1,800 total deaths since the pandemic began uh, in uh, 2020. Contrast those numbers with ours. Korea's approach on COVID-19 has been lauded, and rightly so, as a global model. It's not that complicated. Follow the rules and follow the science. Other changes have been for the worse, such as North Korea's unrelenting pursuit of nuclear weapons. While the DPRK may no longer be the ROK's official enemy, it's helpful to recall that during January, uh, last January's Workers' uh, Party Congress, Kim Jong-un talked about strengthening the North Korean nuclear deterrent and military capabilities. Just last March, the IAEA expressed real concerns about the trajectory of North Korea's nuclear program. And just last week, the U.S. intelligence community formally assessed that Kim Jong-un views nuclear weapons as the ultimate deterrent against foreign intervention, and that over time, he believes that Korea, North Korea will be accepted as a nuclear power. That doesn't sound to me like he's going to give up nuclear weapons anytime soon. But throughout the years, the U.S. ROK alliance has remained and continues to be the bulwark against North Korean aggression and the linchpin upon which regional security and stability stand. There's a satellite photo out there of a nighttime view of the Korean Peninsula. This photo and the stark contrast between the beaming south and the pitch black north represents choices and outcomes what 67 years of our strategic alliance has brought to the people of the South Korea. As the ROK has changed and developed over the years, so too has the U.S. ROK alliance. This alliance is dynamic, a multidimensional partnership reinforced by shared values, shared concerns, and shared economic interests, and underpinned by the deepest people-to-people -people ties. It's lasted generations and will continue to last for generations to come as long as we together nurture it, resource it, and remain committed to it. There are now over 2 million Americans of Korean descent, including four members of Congress, senior officials in our military, U.S. diplomats, state and federal officials, entertainers, and wildly successful business leaders. American music and movies have long been popular in South Korea, but now South Korea is a cultural force in the USA and around the world. Last year, Parasite won the Best Picture Oscar. And just last night, Yoon Yoo Jung was the first Korean actress to ever win an acting Oscar as she took home the Best Supporting Actress, actress um, Academy uh, Award. These strong and growing people, people ties, not only constitute the essential fabric of our dynamic bilateral relationship, but they also provide the resilience for us to overcome any challenges together. Naturally, there are disagreements within the US ROK alliance, which is to be expected in any co equal partnership spanning several decades. The US and the ROK continue to work at the highest levels on issues such as defense cost sharing and a future command structure of Korean American forces on the peninsula, as envisioned by the wartime transfer of operational control or OPCON. So I'm glad that we've reached an agreement on cost sharing. Now we can move on to other issues. The U.S. is fully committed to this alliance and it stands firmly with the ROK. 
So I believe that the outlook for U.S. ROK Alliance is good. This is important because, as you are all well aware, North Korea and the People's Republic of China will continuously test the resolve of our alliance. I will seek ways to weaken our strong ties and sow doubt in order to divide us. Now, we hope, while we hope for diplomacy with North Korea to be successful, we must recognize that hope alone is not a course of action. U.S. and ROK joint military training is designed to support peace on the peninsula and in the region, while ensuring uh, that we maintain readiness and never let our guard down. The quest for dialogue with the North must not be made at the expense of the ability to respond to threats from the North. Dialogue and military readiness must go hand in hand. Idealism must be rooted in realism. There are ample historic examples of what could transpire, including what happened on that fateful day almost 71 years ago, if we're not ready. Read T.R. Fairbanks, This Kind of War, if you remain skeptical. It's unfortunate that North Korea has not yet embraced the opportunity presented by three U.S. and three South Korean presidential summits. The U.S. continues to seek transform relations between Washington and Pyongyang, lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula, and the complete denuclearization of North Korea, all of which were agreed upon in Singapore in 2018 and will set the conditions for a brighter future for the North Korean people. Now, while I believe that Singapore was not a perfect agreement, it's a good starting point, point from which to pursue peace on the peninsula. I hope the Chairman and now General Secretary Kim Jong-un seizes this opportunity. Now a word about the People's Republic of China, the PRC. I'm often asked about whether the ROK is being forced to choose between its own security ally on the one hand and its number one trading partner on the other. This is a false narrative designed to sow doubt about our history and our strength of the alliance. The U.S. has partnered well with China on several important fronts, but the U.S. and Beijing fundamentally disagree on how to approach the global international order. The Chinese government doesn't keep its word, from its treaty with the British on Hong Kong, to its human rights abuses against the Uyghurs, the Tibetans, and others, to its attempts at commercial espionage and its quest to first isolate then dominate Taiwan. This is why we made it very clear through the Indo-Pacific strategy that the U.S. rejects foreign policy based on leverage and dominance and seeks instead to strengthen relationships based on respect equal footing and fair exchange. We believe in partnership economics. We won't weaponize debt. Instead, we strive to build environments that foster good, productive market economies. We encourage every country to work on in its own interests to pursue its own sovereignty. As a former Secretary of State said, China's bullying in the South China Sea reflects a broader choice for nations in the region, coercion and control, or freedom and the rule of law. Now, while the, while the how-to regarding dealing with Beijing was certainly a change with the Biden administration, I note that the fundamental understanding of the PRC has not. Consider that Secretary of State Blinken testified at his confirmation hearing that the previous administration's tougher stance uh, and tougher approach is right, that what is happening in Xinjiang is genocide, and that democracy is being trampled in Hong Kong. Secretary of Defense Austin testified that he's focused on the pacing threat posed by the PRC, and he promised strong support for Taiwan. I wonder if they'll be declared persona non gratis by Beijing. To protect the maritime domain, the U.S. will continue to cooperate with the Indo-Pacific partners, as we've always done, to maintain freedom of navigation and other lawful uses of the sea so that all nations can access and benefit from the maritime commons. In this time of COVID, there are concerns that the PRC is seeking to take advantage of the region's focus on finding the pandemic to coerce its neighbors and press its provocative claims in the South China Sea, as well as to bully Taiwan. There are also concerns that the PRC will exploit nations in need by, by dangling medical aid in exchange for support from PRC talking points. We must remain vigilant. Since the end of World War II, the network of U.S. alliances and partnerships has been at the core of a stable and peaceful Indo-Pacific. No country can shape the future of the region in isolation, and no vision for the region is complete without a robust network of sovereign countries cooperating to ensure their collective interests. 
So let me highlight now the importance of trilateral cooperation between the United States, the Republic of Korea, and Japan. It's crucial for our three nations to work together to enhance our security cooperation and preserve the international rules-based order. Notwithstanding the current tensions between Seoul and Tokyo, the reality is that no important security or economic issue in the region can be addressed without both South Korea's and Japan's active involvement. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me finish by saying that I was given an amazing chance to be the U.S. ambassador to South Korea. Though some of you may beg to differ, I believe that there's no better place to serve as U.S. ambassador and no better partner and strategic ally for the United States than the Republic of Korea. Finally, let me thank you for your interest in America's national security. It's organizations like the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and other similar outfits across the United States that ensure that we have that well-informed citizenry of which uh, Thomas Jefferson spoke so eloquently. A well-informed citizenry is indeed the best defense against tyranny. So thanks, and I look forward to your questions. Admiral Harris, it's uh, great to see you again, and thank you very much for your opening remarks. Uh, I uh, thank the council for having me and uh, making this event possible. So Admiral Harris, uh, when you came to give a talk to the Harvard Kennedy School not too long ago, uh, one of the key feedback points from our students who really enjoyed and learned a lot from that session was the fact that you were a great example of someone who had a portfolio of identities, someone who had uh, previously served as commander of US Pacific Command, as a four-star admiral, as an ambassador of the United States to the Republic of Korea, uh, as well as the inventor of soju teenies in South Korea during your time as ambassador. Uh, so yeah. my first question to you is about your portfolio of identities. Uh, as someone who has led uh, as a senior practitioner in both the world of defense as well as in the world of diplomacy, if you could start off by sharing with us some of the key lessons that you've learned uh, in developing and applying those leadership uh, skills in these different areas, uh, and also what lingers in terms of now looking back upon uh, the various careers, uh, frankly, in all of these different uh, spheres? Yeah, uh, Dr. Park, that's a, that's a great question, and I could talk for the rest of our time on it, uh, but I'll just hit some, <clears throat> hit some high points. Uh, and let me just say that I like that term, portfolio of, of identities. So uh, the best identity is yet to come, and that's civilian flyer fisherman. So that, that's that's my next identity. Right now, I'm I'm in this this uh, 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 never never land between active government service and gray beard stuff. Um, so let, let me talk uh, briefly about the I guess the fundamental lesson that I've taken from my Navy career, 40 years, and and the last part of it as a flag officer, and the last couple of it as a four star and my time as ambassador is that leadership matters. Leaders matter. And accountability resides in the leader alone, and it can be a lonely place. So uh, I believe in, in leader-centric organizations. Uh, and by that, I mean that, that I, I try to set the stage when I take command or when I became the ambassador uh, that the buck stops with me that I'm going to expect a lot from the people who are fortunate or unfortunately are working for me. Uh, I'll cover them and, and advocate for them and work hard for them uh, for their next assignment. But for their present assignment, uh, I expect them to work their asses off. Uh, and that, that I'm accountable for the decisions I make, and I'm not going to try to hide behind somebody else. So leadership matters. Also, because command is a lonely place, uh, mentors matter, people that I can reach out to uh, and uh, seek their advice and counsel that are not in the chain of command because, uh, that, that, you know, uh, familiarity breeds contempt and all of that. So I'm, I'm very fortunate in my life that I have a network of people uh, that I can reach out to, some of which are, are listening uh, in on this uh, webinar today. Uh, Eric Nishizawa comes to mind and, and others. Uh, and uh, I can reach out to these folks. I can seek their advice. Now, whether I take it or not, that's 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 all me. It's it's solely on me. Uh, but I'm not afraid to ask for help, ask for advice, ask for counsel, um, and and that's important. And then 
the third part of that is, you know, I've, I've had the um, opportunity, I guess, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, to go into organizations of which I've had no background. You know, I commanded Guantanamo Bay one time, and well, I had no background on how to do that. Uh, I went to be ambassador to some country one time, and well, I had no idea how to be an ambassador, right? Diplomacy, well, that's a, you know, uh, that's an eight-letter word. I'm not, not sure what it means. Actually, maybe a nine-letter word if I do public math. Uh, and, and other jobs like that. But there are people in the organizations that really, really know the, know the organization. They know the history. They know the, uh, the history of the organization. They know the, uh, the, all the pitfalls. They know all that stuff. And, and as a leader, uh, my job is to listen to them, is to, is to let them tell me how to do my job uh, and, and not be afraid of criticism. So that's the lesson. Those are the lessons that I, I believe uh, just talking off the cuff here um, uh, at this webinar. It's a terrific start. And uh, I think with that, I think with another identity that we can add to your portfolio is communicator. As, as we saw with your opening remarks, uh, your ability to essentially frame and communicate very complex issues in a clear manner. Uh, one of the other things that stood out from your, your comments was that you're very modest about this, but you are also an architect. And what I mean by that is that you're one of the architects of what we now know as Indo-Pacific strategy. This is a US approach to dealing with the region. It is one of the rare areas in the United States where we have bipartisan consensus. Uh, it is also a very grand approach. It's a big strategy. Uh, so with that, there are gonna be some clear messages that get across to friends, allies, and others in the region. But there are also a lot of myths. And I'm, I'm curious, as an architect, and as you've seen the genesis, uh, the growth, and the projection that this is gonna be the mainstay for the US approach to the region, what's a dominant myth that you've encountered? And how do you go about debunking it in your own way? Yeah, I, I think one of the myths uh, is that the United States uh, is a declining power. So, you know, this goes back to uh, Dr. Allison's Thucydides trap, and, you know, who's a rising power, who's a falling power, and are they, are they bound to clash? So I, I think the idea that we are a declining power uh, is, is a myth that other countries, other entities are, 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 are taken, uh, are taking uh, as a fact, right? And so their, their actions are based on this myth, which uh, is, you know, we could come to find, you know, decades now as we look back uh, as a source of a significantly dangerous miscalculation. So I, I think that's, that's the myth. The myth is that, that the U.S. is a declining power. I mean, look at our, our economy, uh, look at our, uh, where we've been in the last couple of years, uh, you know, and, and we're anything but a decline power. I mean, if you look at what happened in, in, in Washington in, uh, in January that I, I spoke about in my remarks, uh, you know, I mean, we came out of that, I think, stronger than, than, uh, than ever. You know, it, it underscored the strength of America's democracy, even as it exposed the rifts in our society, right? And so the fact that we came out of it, I think, as strong as we did uh, is a testament to the resilience and strength of American democracy. Uh, you know, uh, you have, uh, uh, I used to talk about uh, uh, refugees and, and, and boat people, you know, they, they come to America, they don't run away from America. You know, we are, we remain a beacon for, for immigrants uh, to come to, uh, rather than, than a, a place from which uh, uh, people are trying to run away from. And I think that's, that's our strength. We have to you know, uh, there's a lot to be said for immigration policy and, and a big need for a bipartisan one, uh, but that's beyond the scope of, of, of this conversation. So I think those are, uh, are some of the myths. Uh, I think some of the underlying truths uh, that are not myths about the Indo-Pacific strategy is that we are, uh, we are facing a great power competition again. Uh, not to suggest that we're in a cold war, because that was pretty one-dimensional uh, military, uh, security, defense, that kind of stuff. We are in a, in a great power competition uh, with uh, a, a country and, and its, its uh, colleagues, for lack of a better word, uh, that are multidimensional. And, and uh, we have to face up to that. And, and uh, the sooner that we have a more unified approach to the challenge across the, the U.S. Uh, in all, in all uh, sectors of government, particularly, 
but all sectors of our society, uh, then we'll be able to, to deal with that, uh, I think, in a better way. And the final part of the Indo-Pacific strategy that is probably the most important, and I hinted at it in my, in my comments, so I didn't connect it directly with the Indo-Pacific strategy per se, is that alliances matter. Alliances matter. And America's network of alliances and partners, partnerships, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, fundamentally uh, matter. Uh, and and uh, I'm, I'm uh, grateful and gratified uh, that President Biden recognizes the importance of alliances uh, and has taken steps to move out in that direction uh, already uh, within his first 100 days in office. Great. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me, Admiral Harris, this is where I'd like to shift and, and get into uh, uh, some kind of mini case studies here. And, you know, what you've laid out, you know, we've, we've debunked some myths there. You've gone over <clears throat> some uncovering of the truths. One thing that I'd like to take you now down the road is recalibrating misperceptions, because certainly with a region as wide and as diverse as the Indo-Pacific, uh, there are going to be a lot of misperceptions out there. So if I could start off with North Korea and the North Korean threat, uh, it's a two-part question. From your perspective and your experience uh, in various leadership roles in, in the Indo-Pacific area, what do we most underestimate about the Kim regime? Is that one question or two? That's the first one, yes. And, and just as a preview, the, the second that I'll follow up with is, what do we most overestimate about the Kim regime? Yeah, I'm going to answer the question kind of cheating by saying, I, I think we underestimate something that's, that we also overestimate, right? They're, they're related. I think that we underestimate, in my opinion, what KJU, Kim Jong-un, is really all about. I think that he is after... Uh, four things, and if we if we keep these four things in the front of our, our of our minds, and anytime we have any dealings with with him, keep these four things in mind. I think that'll, that'll help us uh, um, go ahead. And those things are what what is he after? What does he want? He wants sanctions relief, right? He wants to keep his nukes. You know, I talked about the uh, intelligence community's assessment and what that means to me. So he, 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 he wants the sanctions to be uh, lifted. And their sanctions are crippling, they're heavy, they're, 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 they're onerous and all of the above. He wants to keep his nukes and be recognized uh, as, a, as a nuclear power by the rest of the world. He wants to split the US-RK lines. He wants to split the US-RK lines. And ultimately then, he wants to dominate the peninsula in a way that the rest of the peninsula looks like North Korea today and is run by the, uh, by the uh, uh, Kim uh, family. So I think that's, that's what he wants. And we underestimate uh, the, uh, the seriousness and the unwillingness to deviate from those four fundamental core wants, if you will. And I think we overestimate our idea that we can shift him out of any of those. So uh, negotiation with North Korea, vitally important. We should get into it. I'm, I'm glad the Biden administration has reached out, at least according to the press. Um, I, I think that, uh, but the idea that we should, uh, you know, uh, relax sanctions in order to bring Kim Jong-un back to the negotiating table, um, it's a bad idea. The idea that we could we could relax our military exercises to bring him back to the negotiating table. Another bad idea. Now, if, if a relaxation of military exercises or some form of sanctions relief is an outcome of negotiations, more, I'm all for it, more power to it. But we shouldn't give up stuff to bring him back to the table. We should simply invite him to the table and if he and if he wants the sanctions re relieved, if he wants uh, exercises reduced, all that stuff, then he's going to have to bring something to the table, also. Uh, but we shouldn't give it up early in order to get him back to the table. Uh, that, that's my view because again, keep those four things uh, uh, in your heads up display, uh, and uh, it'll, it'll keep you on on the right path, uh, in my estimation. That's a great visual about having a HUD there. And, and uh, with that, you know, we're focusing on the individual, uh, Kim Jong-un. And, and as you lay out 
in terms of the contrast here, we're dealing uh, in a very strong way with the pillars of alliances rooted in democratic uh, countries. And so it's the enduring value of those organizations and those systems of governance. But if, if I could uh, shift to my, my last question and I'll turn it over uh, back to Jessica as we have some great questions coming in the queue here. It's to zoom in on China and with the Chinese leader Xi Jinping because we have another instance of a leader that's likely to be there for a long period of time. Uh, so a similar type of approach here, Admiral Harris, uh, when, you, when you look at China and specifically the leadership of Xi Jinping, uh, what are you seeing by way of a misperception that we need to recalibrate? Uh, so approaching it from that angle, and the other option is if you wanted to take it from the overestimation, underestimation aspect, but we'll leave you uh, yeah, that. So, so uh, there's a couple of things on the underestimation part. Of, the, one of the fundamental um, uh, miscalculations that we've made, I think the United States has made over over decades, bipartisan, both parties, uh, both parties in, in power in Washington uh, over time, uh, is that uh, we had this this notion, probably rooted in American uh, naivete, uh, American uh, optimism, that if we if we brought China, the PRC I'm talking about, when we brought if we brought the PRC into uh, global uh, uh, institutions, World Bank, IMF, the, the whole range, United Nations itself, you know, if we brought the PRC into, into these global institutions, over time, the PRC uh, would be molded by those institutions to look more like the rest of us, not, the, not just the United States, but I'm talking about the rest of the free world, democratic, maybe, capitalist, maybe, uh, sensitive to human rights, maybe, that kind of thing. But in fact, the reality is that over time, uh, the PRC has molded those institutions rather than the other way around. Uh, and so that that is both the miscalculation and underestimation of what uh, the PRC is about and an overestimation of our ability, not just our being the United States, but free world, our ability to change uh, the, the PRC. So that, that's another one of those where the overestimation and the underestimation uh, sort of starts to resemble uh, each other. Another uh, area of, uh, of uh, uh, potential overestimation, and we've seen in the past, is that we're going to be able to reach uh, a grand bargain with the PRC now in the, 20, in, in the, in the, in the 2020s. Uh, I think that Max Hastings, uh, uh, when he was writing in Bloomberg a little while ago, he had it about right. And he says that the diplomatic dialogue between Washington and Beijing has just about broken down. and There's little chance of a grand bargain. That doesn't mean, he says, that we shouldn't continue to work in those areas that we can work on, that we should continue to try to de-escalate tensions and all that. And put the grand bargain idea off to, you know, like uh, like Deng Xiaoping said, you know, put it off for later, the smarter people to deal with. But, but we have to, to deal with it here and now, which is to de-escalate tensions, uh, work with the PRC uh, in those areas that we can work with. North Korea is one of those examples. And and uh, uh, you know, uh, not not hope for some some grand bargain. Uh, and finally, uh, you know, I used to speak when I was a PACOM commander that uh, the 2020s was the decade of danger. Well, uh, Admiral Davidson, Phil Davidson, who's the Indo-Pacific commander now, I mean, he's actually put a timeline on it. Uh, he says that, you know, you know uh, uh, the PRC could be ready to attack Taiwan and, and take it back, try to take it back in six years. So he put a timeline on it of six years. So, uh, you know, there's, there's there, the, the Beijing is afoot uh, and we need to uh, be sensitive to that and be vigilant to it in all its forms. Fantastic. Admiral Harris, thank you so much for your, your opening remarks, as well as this uh, basically a speed round, but uh, puts a lot <laughs> on the table. Great food for thought for our Q&A discussion session. Thank you for that. Uh, I'll turn it over now to Jessica for the Q&A moderation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Park and Admiral Harris. It's great to be reunited with you since the Future of Asia conference several years ago. So uh, as, as Dr. Park mentioned, you've been doing a lot since we last saw you. So thank you again. <laughs> Um, our first question, how far should the U.S. go militarily to defend the interests of the U.S., our allies, and partners in the South China Sea? 
China's creeping strategy has been working, it appears. Yeah, so the uh, question is really three parts. Uh, our interests, we should go all the way to defend our interests. Right, and we're talking about America here. So the, 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 we should go all the way, whatever it takes to defend America. American Americans, America, American interests, national interests, national interests, not passing interests, but national interests globally. But Americans globally, America, uh, our homeland, uh, and American national interests globally. Go all the way, whatever it takes. You know, that's why we have a military, and that's why we have a country, uh, that's the country that it is. Uh, how, how far should we go to defend our allies? Uh, all the way, uh, depending on, on, on the alliance and you know, how it's structured. You know, uh, we have we have a lot of alliances. Uh, Evo Dalton recently estimated that we have 55. Uh, I, I actually, he did an estimate. He said it, we, we have 55 allies. Uh, you know, that's all of NATO. He was an ambassador in NATO and uh, our alliances in the Pacific and 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 all that. So uh, each alliance is different, uh, uh, but uh, we should be willing to defend our allies uh, to the extent that the uh, treaties uh, call for all the way, if necessary, depending on the ally. Uh, and then our, our partners, different, you know, they're partners and allies. We have obligations to our partners, uh, but we're not obligated to defend them to the last American, to be honest with you. Uh, and so um, that's the difference between allies and partners. Uh, though we have gone to the defense, come to the defense, depending on what direction you're looking at, uh, of partners uh, across our recent history. Right, I mean, go back to the Gulf War, Kuwait. Kuwait was not an ally. Kuwait was a friend, a partner. And we we went to war uh, in, in Gulf War One uh, to defend uh, our uh, our partner there. Uh, the NATO, the, the only time in history that our Article Five of the NATO alliances have been called into action was when we were attacked on 9/11. So NATO came to our assistance uh, uh, in Afghanistan and other places. So, you know, we have partners, uh, we have allies, uh, and we're going to have to look at each, each relationship stands on its own merit. Uh, and that's important. That's an important concept, I believe. Thank you. What is the timeline leading for North Korea to most likely achieve the ability to manufacture and deliver nuclear missiles? Well, I mean, well, I think we're talking in the past tense. Right? I mean, I mean, we know they have the capability to deliver nuclear, uh, to deliver uh, ballistic missiles, whether they're short-range ballistic missiles, uh, MRBMs, medium-range missiles. And in 2017, they tested ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, that can reach from uh, from North Korea to Washington D.C., L.A., Hawaii, Guam, Japan, South Korea. Right. So they can range us with their missiles. Can they range us accurately? I'm not going to get into intelligence uh, issues. Uh, but that we, they, they could certainly range us. Uh, we know that they're working on a nuclear capability. Uh, can, they can they mate the two? Can they mate uh, their ballistic missiles with their nuclear warheads? Uh, you know, again, that's an intelligence thing and I won't get into. But I will let you know what the intelligence community assesses, and that is that, uh, uh, you know, uh, Kim Jong-un is bent on, uh, uh, on that capability, and he believes that over time the world will recognize him uh, as a nuclear power. Okay. Did President Trump's actions and policies towards North Korea help or hurt the cause of peace in the Korean Peninsula? Look, I, I'm not going to um, grade the president or the former president's uh, homework uh, on that. But I will say that that uh, uh, the President Trump's uh, unorthodox approach uh, changed the dynamic uh, um, uh, in uh, on the peninsula and in the region. Uh, you know, he was willing to to reach out and have a meeting, three meetings actually over time, uh, with Kim Jong Un. No other president's ever done that. Uh, sitting president's ever done that. Um, and so, uh, I think I think the idea uh, that a president, a president of the United States, would be willing uh, to break precedent and meet with uh, an adversarial leader, I think there's merit in that. Now. There's a lot. There's a lot has to. A lot has to go into that. You know, should have gone into it. Um, uh, uh, um, you know, meetings uh, fall through uh, the whole thing. But the idea itself to get at the question you asked 
uh, I think, uh, brought us to a point, uh, brought us to Singapore, really, where we had an agreement to denuclearize the peninsula, improve relations between uh, like North Korea and the United States, work for peace on the peninsula, and then recover uh, remains of, uh, of uh, uh, those killed uh, during the Korean War. Uh, I think that that's, that's, a, that's a, a, a great place that, that we were, uh, uh, that we went to in early 2018. I was still a PACOM commander then. I wasn't in, in Seoul yet. Uh, that that brought us to that point. Uh, you know, and before that, there was the, uh, uh, the uh, yeah, Pyeongchang Winter Olympics at the beginning of 2018. Uh, President Moon and Kim Jong-un and, and, you know, working together and, and, and trying to trying to de-escalate. You know, uh, I was in uh, Hawaii at the end of 2017 uh, at the height of uh, uh, the ballistic missile testing and the nuclear testing. And I can tell you that that the Korean Peninsula was a was a was a pretty nervous place. Uh, my colleagues at the embassy, when I went there later on, they told me that that biz American businesses were calling the embassy, "Hey, should we leave the country?" You, you know, all this other kind of stuff, because you know there was a palpable sense of impending doom uh, uh, in Korea uh, at the end of 2017. This is fire and fury days. You remember all that and uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then, you know, by the time I got to Seoul in in, uh, in the summer of 2018 as ambassador, I mean, it was a it was a dramatically changed place. Uh, it, you know, it was an exciting place pre-pandemic. I mean, I mean, businesses were booming, uh, comp uh, hotels occupancy uh, occupancies were up. Uh, people were optimistic. Uh, it was a changed place, and that alone is worth a lot. Right, when you can change the psyche of an entire country and all the different countries whose citizens live and work and visit there. And then, so uh, there's, and all that is because uh, both President Trump and President Moon were willing to meet uh, with uh, Kim Jong-un. Uh, so that's worth a lot. Now, should there have been more follow-ups? Could there have been a different kind of set of uh, follow-up actions? For sure. Uh, and maybe that's where we are now. I don't know. You know, as uh, uh, as we learned at the beginning of this uh, webinar, uh, we know that the Biden administration is working toward uh, a policy statement on North Korea. I don't know what that uh, what that is. I haven't been asked for my uh, input into it, and I don't want to be seen as using this uh, webinar in the media to try to somehow influence. That's that's their baby, and 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 he has got the, he's got the right team. Uh, you know, Kirk Campbell, Jake Sullivan. Uh, yeah, Sun Kim. He's got the right team of folks working on that, and I think it'll be a it'll be a terrific product. Uh, but that's coming out. Don't know what it's going to say. Don't know what approach it's going to take. Don't know what starting point uh, it'll it'll try to uh, take uh, with North Korea. But uh, you know, we're all waiting with bated breath, as Shakespeare used to say. Indeed. Uh, this question has a nice follow-up question to actually what you just mentioned. How would you evaluate the current approach of the Republic of Korea's government to improving the relationship with North Korea? Why do you think its embracing approach to North Korea has not produced any tangible results and the North has become more hostile toward the Moon administration? What needs to be changed to acquire better results? Yeah. I know you kind of said you didn't want to comment on this, so, but yeah, I'll ask. I think, that's a better, I think that's a better question to ask Consul General Park. I mean, I don't want to speak with a South Korean government. Uh, I'm no longer uh, in government myself, uh, but as to the intent uh, of the Moon administration, that is a question that Consul General Park is far better qualified to answer than me. You've become a true diplomat. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This next question. Um, could you briefly highlight the similarities and differences between your leadership style as American ambassador to South Korea compared to the leadership style of former ambassador and Doosan Bears superfan Mark Lippert? Additionally, how yeah. do you see the role of public diplomacy between South Korea and the U.S. in the next five or ten years? Yeah, I, I don't want to take a wild guess here, but I suspect that Mark may have sent that question to you. I'm just saying. Uh, uh, I thought that Mark Lippert was an amazing, an amazingly effective investor. Uh, you know, uh, he was loved by the Korean people. Uh, he did a great job representing U.S. interests. Uh, and, uh, you know, he had a built-in uh, uh, thing with his dog. Uh, you know, people love this dog. 
uh, and and uh, the baseball piece. I mean, he, there was there was so much to admire and try to emulate. And he had he had two kids, and uh, he, he gave them Korean names. Uh, of course, he was attacked in Korea, uh, and uh, and I just wasn't willing to try to have kids at my age. Uh, I didn't have a dog. Uh, no one attacked me physically, uh, so you know I, I felt somehow unworthy. Uh, but he, he and I uh, are colleagues and friends. Uh, I spoke uh, on his uh, podcast at, at uh, CSIS uh, not too long ago. Uh, ultimate total respect for him, uh, and I wish I was as effective as Mark was. Uh, I tried to do the best I could, uh, you know, uh, uh, representing uh, President Trump uh, in uh, South Korea. You know, you can be the judge of this better than me. It's probably a little bit different than representing President Obama uh, in, in South Korea. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I thought that, that Mark did a fabulous job. Uh, and uh, if I was uh, even uh, a modicum of, uh, of effective, as effective as he was, then I'd be a success. So um, my hat's off to him. Thank you. What is your assessment of the success of the Obama strategic pivot to Asia? And should Asian governments be reassured that the Biden administration is composed of so many Obama era officials who are associated with the pivot? Yeah, I, I think they should be very reassured. Uh, because you know we're not talking to amateurs coming in here that 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 uh, you know you have to show them on a map where Asia is right, uh, and so th these are these are the are the are the are the are, are the great current minds, uh, the policy practitioners that, that know how to get things done. Yeah, you know, we're talking Kirk Campbell, uh, you know the Asia's R O at NSC, uh, Jake Sullivan, all the cow. I mean he's he's got to be one of the smartest guys in government, if not the smartest. Uh, Sun Kim, who's, who's acting as Assistant Secretary of State, you know, a current ambassador to Indonesia, a former ambassador to Korea. Uh, Dave Helvey uh, over at uh, uh, Defense, long, long hand in that. Um, the fact that, and, and, and back to the, the, to the basic question about the pivot, the pivot was the right thing to do. The, 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 the shortfall of the pivot, if you will, uh, was uh, the resourcing of it. And the resourcing of it is not the president's decision, right? I mean, the resourcing of, of, of things like the pivot to Asia, rebalance to Asia, that's a congressional decision. That's an appropriations uh, uh, and budgetary decisions. So uh, the first thing is identify the problem set. Hey, you know, we're going to pivot to Asia. We're going to rebalance to Asia. Second thing is to, to resource it. Well, you know, that, that's another branch of government has to deal with that. And, and Admiral Davidson, who's the Indo-Pacific Command Commander now, he just testified uh, last month, or maybe in uh, two months ago, I guess, when he, he was back in Washington for testimony. He's seeking $25 billion over five years, six years, uh, uh, in, in an initiative that looks a lot like ERI, the European Reassurance Initiative in the Obama administration, where, where Congress actually appropriated money, uh, uh, separate money, uh, to uh, uh, to uh, uh, for for European commands use uh, in in the in reassuring our European allies. Davidson, I tried to do it when I was a pickup commander. I failed miserably. Davidson is trying to do it now to to get money not not authorized. You know, not take the DoD top line and say, okay, within that top line, you're allowed to carve out uh, a pot of money uh, to to spend on on the on the Pacific uh, reinitiative, uh, uh, reassurance initiative, because that means that if you take the top line and then you you carve out money from that, that means each of the services are going to get some increment less than they would otherwise. The ERI European reassurance initiative was money on top of that, right? And that's what Davidson is trying to get. He's trying to get money on top of the DoD budget to put some put some resourcing, put some teeth uh, behind the Indo-Pacific strategy. Which is what we didn't have during the uh, the pivot first, and then the rebounds to the Pacific during the Obama years. Not the President's fault, at all in my view. Thank you so much. What is your opinion of the Trans-Pacific Partnership and possible subsequent agreement? For example, consequences of the U.S. withdrawing from the process, and if the Biden administration might replace it. Yeah. So um, when I was in uniform uh, at at PACOM uh, as a as an admiral in the Navy. I was a, a, a staunch public 
advocate for TPP. Unusual position, some would say, for a military, for a uniform officer to take, but I took it from the security aspect. There were aspects of TPP that if if the if the countries in TPP were linked economically, then then there would be security linkages and benefits from that economic linkage. So there were clear security benefits, one of which was cyber policies. You know, you'd have a cyber policy and the bar set really high uh, and, and that would improve our, our uh, cyber security in the DOD sense uh, throughout the, the partners in TPP. Just, just one example. The alternative to TPP at the time was something called RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive uh, e Economic Plan posed by the PRC. And, and in that grouping of countries, uh, uh, you know, there was uh, it, it, it could it could harm us if we didn't have um, um, uh, a a competing uh, a different uh, relationship among other countries. And TPP was was that counter relationship. Uh, so I was an advocate for TPP. I was disappointed uh, personally uh, that the United States pulled out of TPP. Um, I, th I thought then it was a bad idea. I think now it, it is a bad idea. And I'm hopeful uh, that the TPP countries will allow the United States, because it's their decision, not ours, to get back in. And it's our decision whether we're going to try to get back in, but it's their decision to let us in because it's it's their partnership, not ours. Right. So I'm hopeful that, that we'll try to get back in and, and they'll let us in. And, and uh, we can move forward from there. Thank you. This questioner says, fun question if I may, did Admiral Harris ever hang out with Dennis Rodman and get his two cents <laughs> on how to deal with the North Korean regime? Yeah, that's a great question. No, I never did hang out with, with uh, Mr. Rodman. And, uh, uh, and uh, you know, when I was talking about mentors and seeking advice in difficult jobs, I never did reach out to him. Maybe I should have, uh, but I did not. Fair enough. If you um, ask that question, I'd, I'd love to have a chat with him about it. All right, so. sounds good. Well, I'll see if I can set that up for our next webinar. Um, does the Admiral have an explanation for recent Asian discrimination, aside from the COVID-19 pandemic coming from China? Yeah, uh, so I'm affected by that. I'm an Asian American uh, myself. Um, uh, and, and unfortunately, I don't have uh, a, a way to explain it away. I, I think we ought not to try to explain it away. I think we ought to instead try to fight it. Uh, I'm, I'm gratified by the uh, by a lot of uh, recent moves uh, to uh, to go after Asian American hate, including uh, most recently in the Senate. It, it passed the Senate 94 to one. I mean, 94 to one. I mean, nothing passed the Senate 94 with 94 votes. And now it's going to move to the House. I'm sure it'll pass the House and maybe we can get a law. About it, that 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 makes it a hate crime and all that. Uh, it's it's distressing. You know, I grew up in the in the deep South uh, as a Japanese American little boy, and uh, I never felt any of that. Uh, the only time I'll be honest with you that I felt uh, prejudiced against because of my ethnic background was when I was the Indo when I was at first a Pacific Fleet commander, and then the Indo and then the Pacific Command commander when the PRC attacked my Japanese ethnicity. Uh, and called me America's Japanese admiral. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's the only time that I felt uh, 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 racially attacked. And a little bit in, in, in Korea, you know, when I would um, cover, uh, when I would uh, represent the president, that's the ambassador's job. Uh, then there were certain uh, elements uh, in Korea that also attacked my Japanese uh, uh, ancestry. Uh, but those are the only times in my life, right? And now we're back in the United States, and, and um, uh, you know, two weeks ago I was walking downtown Colorado Springs with a mask on, so all you can see is my eyes. Uh, and then some some guy said, "Hey, are you an Asian?" You know, and that kind of stuff. And it was like, "Oh, okay, I haven't, I've never experienced this in our country before." Uh, and that was just that was that was next to nothing uh, compared to what uh, some of our uh, Asian American uh, 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 citizens. Are, are facing uh, uh, in big cities across the United States. I mean, it's disgusting, uh, in my view. And uh, anything we can do to make uh, this stop, uh, we ought to do. 
Thank you. Well, and you briefly mentioned that, that you moved to Tennessee and of course, Minari just had uh, some great opportunities at the Academy Awards. So I wonder if you could just kind of talk briefly before we go back to Dr. Park about your experience moving, having your mom move from Japan to Tennessee and maybe kind yeah. of saw any parallels between you and uh, yeah. Alan Kim in the film. Yeah, I don't know if there are real parallels, but my mom grew up uh, in a privileged uh, uh, family um, in uh, Kobe, uh, Japan. Lost everything during the war, but uh, including her family. But but the, uh, uh, the the point is that you know as a as a privileged privileged little Japanese girl, she had all of the modern conveniences that were extant. Uh, in Japan uh, in the 30s and even even uh, uh, even in the 40s, and then we we moved to Tennessee when I'm a baby, and she's married my dad who's a, a, a Navy sailor that uh, they they met in, uh, in in Japan during the occupation, uh, and he takes her back home to Tennessee when he retires from the Navy, and we had no running water, uh, we had no electricity, you know if you didn't grow it, uh, kill it. Or catch it, you didn't eat. Uh, you know, she's trying to cook on a on a wood stove. Uh, you know, she's trying to learn how to cook American recipes. And you know, it says preheat the oven to 450 or whatever. Well, there's no preheating in a wood stove. It's either hot or it's not hot. And so, you know, she's trying to figure that out. You know, I gotta go to the bathroom. We gotta run outside to the outhouse. Uh, you know, and uh, she's trying to uh, 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 heat in the winter on a coal stove. C O A L. So that means you got to go out to the coal pile, drag in a bucket of coal, and, you know, all that stuff. Uh, and I'm a little boy, and I, I love it. You know, I mean, what do I know? I, mean, I, didn't, I, don't, I don't remember anything from Japan. And I'm just growing up like every other little poor kid there in, in uh, that part of Tennessee. So uh, I, I get it. I identify with it. I, I was talking earlier about, uh, you know, my father had some some idea that he could be a farmer. Uh, he, he was He's not a farmer. He was a, he was a machinist made in the Navy. And my mother probably thought she was the Eva Gabor character in Green Acres. You know, there she is in this, in this, uh, uh, she's gone back in time. You know, she used to call herself a pioneer woman because, you know, she wasn't far removed from the Westerns on TV that she used to watch. So um, different, different kind of growing up. And I get it. I understand a little bit. I don't want to, you know, put my experience on someone else. But I understand a little bit of what was happening in Minari. Uh, great, great, great movie. Uh, yeah. And uh, uh, Union Jew, so glad you won the Oscar, deserves it mightily. Uh, and, uh, you know, so there you go. Thanks for, thanks for the, for the traipse down memory lane. Of course. No, we're, we're so happy to. Uh, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. And Dr. Park, I'm going to turn this back over to you. Uh, Consul General Park also, thank you for being with us today. Admiral Harris and Jessica, thank you so much for the Q&A session there. Uh, Admiral Harris, I just wanted to mention uh, with that another connection to Minari, which was last night uh, you saw uh, Yoon Yo Jung talk about how she got to meet Brad Pitt. And, you know, Brad yeah. Pitt, the lead actor in A River Runs Through It. And so the connection to your next uh, career move here as a fly fisherman. Uh, I thought Good a deal. number of great intersections with uh, Minari in your life. Brad Pitt uh, also that uh, present future. He was one of the producers, I think, of Minari. Or he was uh, one of the backers of it when it was in its inception. That's right. Plan B, absolutely. A great uh, production outfit. Uh, just yeah. very briefly on my end, uh, but uh, a very strong word of, of thanks for your many years of military service and public service leadership. Uh, we have very much to be grateful for and uh, wishing you all the best with uh, the next phase of the fly fisherman uh, career there. Thank you, Admiral Harris. To you. Thanks, Dr. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. Thanks, President Blue. Thank you both. This was, Ambassador, this was a wonderful, personal, timely, informative conversation. We have to have you back. This was great. We do want to find out about the fly fishing, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll let you know. Thank Anytime you. I can be helpful, please, please don't hesitate to reach out. Jessica knows how to do it. Thank you so very much. All right. See you all. Thanks. Have a great day. I also want to thank Consul General Park and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for the Republic of Korea, who are very helpful today. So thank you. Thank All you very much, Edward Harris and uh, uh, Chairperson Kim, for this wonderful event. Thank you so much. Yesterday, Yoon Yeo-jung asked Tom Brad, uh, Brad Pitt to invest more money 
in Defium. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Take care.